Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here and staying connected with Ollie at HSU. I'm, I'm Kim Laney, your Ollie coordinator, and we're really happy to have you here today um, for the conversation with David Marshak about use, um, changing the world for the better. We are going to um, have you put your questions in the chat today, and Dave will um, give you a little bit more instructions. If you've never used them before, you should be able to find the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Um, still within the black Zoom box area. And if you need some help, you can always um, raise your hand or send me, well, I guess you can't send me a message if you don't know how to use chat. So um, we'll work it out and you can always unmute yourself and um, ask me and I can, I can help you with that. And speaking of, I will ask that you um, go ahead and mute yourself because we do um, need you to not be distracting. And every time you cough or make noises, it does distract from the presentation. So um, do please mute yourself. And if you um, have a question, like I said, you can put it in the chat or if you unmute yourself, I will, um, I will work with you to get you all set up. Um, so Ollie is a membership based organization and we are, um, in the middle of our Ollie member year, usually runs from um, July 1st to June 30th. So we're just a little over halfway. And if you're not an Ollie member, we would love you to, to join us. And I encourage you to sign up. Um, these presentations are made possible by uh, friends of Ollie. And friends of Ollie are anybody who have given any kind of donation or, um, or, or just any kind of support with, um, to our Ollie program. And we thank them for their generosity. Um, we are happy to have different ways to stay connected. These brown bag presentations are free and open to the community because of the Friends of Ollie. We also have um, the Stay Connected group that meets on Fridays. And um, if you're interested, you can, the information is on your screen now and you can find more on our Ollie website. Um, I've added this slide to let you know that we would encourage, we do encourage you to sign up early. Our registration process is not automated. It's a manual process. And so if you sign up for a class in the last minute, it's possible that you won't get the Zoom link before the class starts. And that would be a disappointment for everybody. So um, please, three days is better than, than 24 hours, but 24 hours will probably still get you in the class. So. Um, please do sign up early for any classes. We have about one more week of classes in our winter session. Um, and then we will be having a little break and then our spring session starts March 1st and the catalog should be arriving in your mailbox hopefully the end of this week, possibly the beginning of next week. And here is um, the information on how you stay connected or how you can connect with us. So um, again, the best way is an email. Um, if you call us on the phone, your voicemail just goes straight through to our email anyway. Um, but that's the, the email, ollie at humble.edu is always the best way to get a hold of us. Um, I think that's all I have on that. Um, if you have any questions, again, you can either send it to me in the chat or raise your hand and I will be looking for you. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn this over to Jane so that she can introduce our guest today. And uh, thank you all for being here and staying connected with Ollie at HSU. Enjoy the presentation. Thank you, girl, you're so pretty. You're so thank you, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. Uh, welcome, and we're delighted to have you here. David Marshak is an emeritus professor of, tell me, psychology, is it, David? Education. Education. I thought it was also psychology, sorry. At Seattle University, he was the founding president of the Self-Design Graduate Institute and is the author of Inviting Youth to Claim the Power of Their Imaginations, a guidebook, and it looks like this. And you can he will probably be able to tell you how to get that. Um, and it's very interesting. It's a lot of fun. And I'm looking forward to his talk. So David, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. So thank you all for being here. Um, this is an interesting way to give a talk, of course. So I'm going to uh, start my PowerPoint. Um, first, I have to share the screen now. I'm going to have to pick the right. Here we go. And then, okay, so um, you should be able to see a blue blot with the caption, how youths are changing the world for the better now. 
And if you can't, um, why don't you email Kim and she could help you with this. Okay. So um, the way that I'd like to work this is uh, I'm going to talk for uh, maybe 10 or 12 minutes. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. There we go. Okay. And, um, and then I'll stop and um, take a look in the chat. It's really not possible right in the in the middle of that kind of conversation, but I'm happy to actually talk with people at the end. Um, uh, but what I will do is if you put questions in the chat, I'd be happy to respond to them along the way. So what I wanna do is um, give you an access to a different way of understanding the history of what we call adolescence, which is a term that I'm gonna argue we should abandon because it has too many incorrect associations with it. So these are some of the young people I'm gonna introduce you to um, a little bit later on in the talk. But before we get there, I wanna lay out the um, history of adolescence and illustrate um, what I would argue is a fundamental error that we have made sort of inevitably in understanding the capacities and potentials of people between the ages of 13 and 19. So, um, you know, I found it really interesting. I've given variations of this talk and in my book um, booklet, you know, I say homo sapiens has been around for 200,000 years. But when I was taking a look at the literature the other day, I found that there's a recent discovery in 2017 um, that added another 100,000 years. So we're actually back to 315,000 years um, of Homo sapiens. So this is the first discovery of a skull that has the modern characteristics of Homo sapiens. Um, so this is 100,000 years older than we previously thought. And then there's some different discourse about what is a modern Homo sapiens. And there's actually a subspecies of Homo sapiens called Homo sapiens sapiens. You know, we're not a particularly modest species. Um, we call ourselves the wise uh, beings, wise men. And then just to top it off, we call ourselves the wise, wise men. But even if you take that back, let's use 160,000 years. So basically for 160,000 years minus 120 years, people reached puberty, human beings reached puberty, and then they became adults in the societies that they lived in. Uh, whether these were complex cities or empires um, or religious organizations of states or simple agrarian communities or whatever the entire range of human social experience Prior to 1904, people became adults. They had sexual activities. They they had they got married. They had children. They lived in uh, a, an adulthood in their societies. Uh, many many of them were very useful because in their in their late teens they were uh, physically in their prime. Um, you know, there's a reason that. Uh, uh, college athletics are so intense and successful because you have people between the ages of 18 and 24 or so who are in their physical prime in many ways. So about 120 years ago, a guy named Granville Stanley Hall, G. Stanley Hall, invented adolescence, literally. And you can see here uh, some of his background. So here's uh, Granville, uh, very much a, a patriarch of the 19th century. Although, you know, maybe my beard is very similar to his. How about that? Um, so in 1904, he published Adolescence, its psychology and its relation to physiology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's actually two volumes and he coined the term adolescence from the Latin word adolescere. So Granville um, did not think all that much about people in this age group. And 
So to give it a context, he was a college president. He was a psychologist. The uh, people who went to college in those days were essentially the male children, either of the, what Marx would call the ruling class, we might call it the 1%, or young men who wanted to become ministers in Protestant churches. So it was a very small percentage of the population. They were all male. And from this particular group of people, this small subgroup of people, um, he generalized dramatically. Uh, he believed that society needed to burn out the vestiges, here I have to move this to read this, uh, of evil in their nature. I mean, this is the fundamental starting point of it, defining adolescence, uh, overcoming the beast-like impulses um, mood disruptions, conflict with parents, and risky behavior. So of course, this is all familiar to all of us because to a large extent, this impression of the capacities of human beings at this age is still with us, you know, 120 years later. Uh, here's another quote that I like uh, from, from Granville, they're passionate, irascible, apt to be carried away. They're slaves to their passion. He misspelled this, not me. Uh, as their ambition prevents their ever brooking a slight and renders them indignant at the mere idea of enduring an injury. Um, this, this, is, this is the impression of adolescence. Now, the thing about this is that Around 1900, when, when Hall was beginning to articulate this notion in the culture, um, fewer than 10% of the population of people between the age of 14 and 18 were even enrolled in high school. High school, again, was something that a relatively small percentage of the population went to and completed. Again, mostly male, although there certainly were some uh, young women who went to high school. And high school was not the norm. The norm in American society was that people in that age basically would go to work. Now, I'm not saying it's a wonderful thing that 14 year olds would go to work in the factories. I'm not defending child labor. Um, and clearly there was a reason that child labor laws began to be passed in the progressive era roughly around 1905, uh, the states began to pass. But again, one of the reasons that, that states passed child labor laws was not just to protect the children, but also to uh, make sure that there were jobs because there were so many immigrants coming in. So anyway, in this lovely graph, you can see that there was a dramatic increase. High school enro enrollment went from being unusual to being normative by 1960. So this is an important, another important marker in understanding what happened with adolescents. Um, compulsory school attendance, this is a whole other part of it. You know, why do we compel youths to go to school? Well, um, this is a, a large issue. Many books have been written about this, but the bottom line is the state, uh, every state compels uh, youths to be in school up to the age of 16. And many of them like California, 25 in fact, compel up to the age of 18. So we essentially have um, a compulsion about high school in this country, a legal compulsion about high school. You know, we don't trust that youths are gonna go to school. We don't trust that the parents will want them to go to school. Um, they're legally required to go to school. So what happened, and the nice thing about talking about this with an audience like this um, is that we were all there, you know, and maybe, maybe not Kim, um, but the rest of us, we were all there in the 1960s, I would imagine anyway, unless some of you, you know, had a time loop or something. So something really different happened in the 1960s, not only in the United States, but all over the industrial world. And while the number, the percentage of, ado of adolescents, so adolescence is 
an, ex an expression of wealth, a manifestation of wealth in an industrial society. Because prior to 1900, almost every society needed people of this age to work. They needed their economic contribution or they needed them in the military. They needed the women to be procreating. Um, they needed youths, what we call youths, to take on adult roles. And a lot of that also was, if you think about the average lifespan um, in the United States or in the United Kingdom uh, in 1880, the average lifespan was about 50 years. So, you know, we couldn't afford to waste eight or 10 or 20 years with people experiencing adolescence. So a couple of things came together. One was this wealth that was generated from industrial society. Um, and the other was the fact that these folks were no longer needed in the, in the economic activity of the society. Societies were getting richer and richer. The lifespan was being expanded. Um, and so we didn't need 13 to 19 year olds to be part of the economic apparatus. And this began a little bit to manifest in the 1920s. Um, you know, if you go back and look at the, the so-called jazz age, this is really the beginning of popular culture and of youth culture. But the jazz age was really more people in their 20s than people in their teens. So the real flowering of adolescence took place in the 1960s. And um, this had to do, of course, with the baby boom after World War II, the incredible number of us <laughs> who were born and showed up and reached into, you know, became 13 or older. Um, people who were born in 1946 became 13 in 1959. You know, they're right on schedule. And I would suggest to you that there were five phenomena in the United States that created a very atypical experience of adolescence. Now, this was the first widespread manifestation of adolescence um, in the United States. And the same is true in Canada or in Western Europe, but I'm just gonna focus on the United States for uh, this conversation because um, this is where I imagine we were. So the first thing that affected this was um, probably everyone here can remember from childhood um, that for the most part, radios and record players in our early childhood were large family size um, <coughs> pieces of technology, like the size of washing machines or you know televisions that sat in the living room and um, we didn't have them in our bedrooms. We didn't have our own record players in, the, in, in childhood and certainly not our own radios. Um, but in, in 1956, the transistor radio was invented or first came on the market. And the transistor radio, um, you know, I can remember this from my own experience uh, I saved up my allowance, I think, for seven months uh, to buy my first transistor radio. I was nine. So this is 1958. And um, I think I also, uh, you know, cut some lawns and shoveled some snow and did all those good things. And I believe it cost me $10, which was an extraordinary amount of money. That would be about $120 now. So that was a lot of money for a nine-year-old kid. But the transistor radio gave children and teens independent access to media. You could listen to the transistor radio without your parents knowing what you were listening to. So this was a fundamental part of the phenomenon of creating the 1960s youth culture. Uh, record players came along, cheap record players came along in the 60s and people began to have record players in their bedrooms. Um, I never did. I was always jealous of my friends who had record players. Um, obviously, television came along and television became uh, universal in the United States by the 60s and became another vehicle for articulating youth culture. So the third phenomenon that made the distinction, made this atypical um, 
even though it was the very first flowering of adolescence, was that our experience in the 1960s was so radically different than our parents' experience. Um, we grew up in an era of growth and unemployment, I'm mean, sorry, mass employment. Um, I think unemployment was below 3%, you know, from all the way until 1968. Um, there was no inflation. There was interest, not much, but there actually was interest. Um, the, the economy was not dominated by Wall Street, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, CEOs, you know, only made 30 or 40 times uh, what their lowest paid worker. I mean, we grew up in a time of relative equality in the economy, although we didn't necessarily know it at the time. But our parents had grown up with a great deal of trauma and adversity and poverty and anxiety. And um, we as youths, you know, had a limited capacity for appreciating their anxiety, their trauma, inevitably. That wasn't our experience. Our experience was that everything was pretty good. So this is another part of, um, you know, what led to what we then called, if you recall, the generation gap. Um, so a fourth element, which hasn't been given enough attention, but which also played a big part in this, was that um, in 1959, uh, James Conant, who had been the president of Harvard, he was a scientist. Um, he was also appointed by Harry Truman to be the the Viceroy in Germany after the war, uh, he released a report about high schools and he said American high schools were failing because for the most part, they were not able, they were too small to offer four years of science and four years of math. And in order to do that, they had to get bigger. And interestingly enough, this report had an enormous impact. You know, uh, he was on the cover, if you recall, of Life and Look and Time and Newsweek. And I'm sure we all remember that these were the mainstream uh, media at that time, as well as television. But you know, television news was not very important in 1960 because um, they just had these 15 minute broadcasts. So these magazines were much more important in the mainstream culture. And um, so there was a movement to consolidate these small high school districts. You know, up till 1960, every little town in America had its own high school. And they were consolidated. And we were put in buses. And, you know, in the West and the Midwest, kids would spend, this is before busing for racial equality. And in fact, there was 10 times as much busing for school district consolidation as there ever was for racial equality. And the size of high schools went, the average high school went from 260 to 610. And 610 is large enough to create um, opportunities for, for students to get lost. At 260, basically, you know, everybody was known by some adult. At 610, half the kids were not known by any adult. So this created another opportunity for youth culture because uh, again, if you remember, one of the key elements in youth culture in the 60s was alienation, which then led to the final factor in creating this, which was the war in Vietnam. And I'm sure I don't need to describe this for any of us. So my argument here is that this very atypical historical moment that we experienced personally created a definition of adolescence, the potentials of adolescence, the capacities of adolescence that actually is very skewed and speaks more to the particulars of this particular period rather than to the capacities and potentials of youth um, for our species. So let's see, let me see what my next slide is. Yeah, so this just uh, sort of amplifies what I've been saying. Uh, the phenomena of the time, um, to move this so I can see what I said here, here. Um, here we go. Were particular causal factors to these specific years. They were not indicative of the capacity of youths ultimately. 
Okay, um, let me do one more and then I'll stop and see if there are questions. So I would argue if we look at youth now, um, you know, the generation gap is minimal. We don't hear about the generation gap. I mean, the, I don't think we could, if you go and did a search for the generation gap, it would kind of disappear by 1985. Um, but what's new is that the internet has empowered youth in a way that goes far beyond what was available to us in, 19, in the 1960s. And the internet is also diminishing the perception of national, racial, and ethnic differences among the young. There are people on the internet from all over the planet and they're interacting with each other in ways that have very little to do with uh, historic national ethnic racial identities. And yet, what do we do in the United States? And of course, in all these other countries that are still industrial paradigm schooling, um, we hold youths captive in what I call the high school teen ghetto. And um, what else let me just say about this and then let me stop here. I, I would argue that high school, you know, the argument for high school, which may have been true in 1920 uh, or 25 when my father entered high school and was somewhat less or much greatly less in 1967 when I entered high school, but has no validity now, which is high school supposedly prepares you for the future. But I would argue there's almost nothing in the high school curriculum now that prepares people for the future because we don't know what the future is going to be 10, 20 years from now. Okay, so let me stop here and see if I have any questions in the chat. So does anybody like to, I don't see anything. I don't see any questions in the chat either, David, but Sam, do you have a question? No, I was just turning my video on and hit the wrong button. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, here we go. It says, um, we haven't developed a curriculum that encourage young people to be engaged or learn the skill they need. Well, um, so I would, I would argue, Jay, that, that we need to um, get youths out of high school. Not that the, it needs to be completely removed, um, but that we need to, we, we have an enormous resource and I'm gonna show, I'm gonna hopefully prove this to you in a couple of minutes, um, that um, is available to us for creativity. Um, and um, we're not inviting it. And these young people are, are going forward regardless of the fact that we're trying to keep them in high school. So, you know, it's not that uh, we need to abandon it entirely, but we, I would argue we need to revision. The key concept is that we need to invite youth into adult society. We need to invite them into the lives of our communities and we need to invite them into, we need to first, on addition to that, we need to take them seriously and ask them, what do you see that would help make life better in our society. And then we need to engage them in working toward that. Um, let me see a couple of questions here. Um, the, the impact of texting and youth communication, a question from Terry. Yeah, well, all of the different social media, obviously, I, I'm, you know, I'm far too old to be an expert about what's going on in social media. So I don't pretend to know the particulars of it, but it is clear to me that there are all kinds of communication going on on the planet that have nothing to do with um, our national boundaries. And obviously it's clear to all of us that social media is a really mixed blessing because it's, um, one could argue, there's as much negativity as there is positivity. But unfortunately, from my point of view, we're much more focused uh, right now on the negativity. You know, we don't have vehicles to tell us, to show us the positivity. Has the generation gap really disappeared? I think it has to a large extent, Jane, actually. 
It's certainly not what it was. And you see that and particularly, um, you know, one of the things that happened with COVID um, is that a lot of young people went home to live with their parents. Um, now, do you think that would have happened in 1968? I, I don't think so. So, so let me go forward. I've already taken up a half an hour here. So let me move on here. Um, go back and share my screen. Okay. Um, the present, whoops, what am I doing? Here we go. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to introduce you some of these folks I'm sure you already know about. Um, I'm just going to quickly go over them. I'm sure you all know about Greta. Um, you know, how does a 15 year old from Sweden become a global uh, thought leader? How does that happen? So Boyan Slot is an interesting young man. He's from the Netherlands. Um, he went uh, on a vacation to swim in Greece 11 years ago, 10 years ago, and you know found a lot of plastic in the Mediterranean and decided that somebody need to figure out how to get the plastic out of the ocean. So he began giving talks about this, you know, as a 15, 16 year old, uh, he began raising money. I think he's raised about $350 million now. He has a variety of corporate partners. And a year ago, he launched essentially a plastic wing out from San Francisco into the Pacific, um, six or 700 yards long. And the idea was that they would float this out into the plastic uh, wasteland in the Pacific and collect plastic using the current. So um, what they found with his ocean cleanup structure 001 was that it collected plastic, but what it didn't quite work because um, once it collected the plastic, uh, it was difficult to do anything with it. So he raised another couple hundred million dollars, went back to the drawing board. He's not the primary engineer. You know, he's, he has a team of people working for him and they're actually trying out uh, number two uh, in the North Sea right now. If you're interested, you can find, he has a website and, uh, so, but the thing I think that's really, you know, maybe he won't, maybe they won't succeed. Um, you know, up until this point, what we've heard is that it's impossible to collect the plastic. But, you know, this young man said, you know, I'm going to try to do this. We'll see what happens. Uh, Malala, I'm sure you're familiar with, um, you know, she began writing, publishing about her life, um, you know, in Northwestern Pakistan, uh, in a fundamentalist Muslim uh, community that was essentially being governed by the Pakistani Taliban uh, and began writing as a 12 year old for publication in Britain and then came out, excuse me, as an activist for girls education. Uh, the Taliban shot her in the head. Uh, she survived thanks to the fact that she was already somewhat famous and got herself airlifted out and got medical care. Um, and she's continued to be uh, an important global figure in many ways. And I'm sure we'll hear more from her. Uh, she decided to go to college, probably a good idea. So Adam Avon, I, I bet you've never heard of. Um, he's a young man when he was 14, uh, he created a children's wellness foundation to teach mindfulness called the Wuf Shanti Foundation, W-U-F and then Shanti. Um, and this is a nonprofit that's produced videos and books and a mobile app and music and games um, and has taught about mindfulness uh, in about 50 countries around the world. So he's continued, he's a little bit older than 14 now, certainly. Um, so this young woman, uh, I'm not exactly sure where she is now, but when I became aware of her a couple of years ago, she was a senior in high school um, in a suburb of Minneapolis. And so she had started a climate action, oh, in Minnetonka. She had started a climate action group in Minnetonka. She was working on a climate action group um, 
on, and on a state level in Minnesota. And she was one of the drafters of a climate action plan, the Minnesota Green New Deal bill, um, which is not going anywhere in Minnesota right now because the Republicans control the state Senate there. So nothing's happening right now. But so she decided to become a local and state level, a climate activist. Joshua Wong, you probably heard of. Um, eight years ago, nine years ago, he was one of the, at the age of 14, uh, he led one of the leaders of the umbrella movement in Hong Kong, uh, which was really the first widespread uh, activity demonstrations against the Chinese government. And he was also a major leader in the, in the demonstrations that took place in 2018 and 2019. Um, and the Chinese government, of course, now has tried him and imprisoned him, which is what they've been doing to all these folks in Hong Kong. Um, but I imagine uh, he will eventually get out and we will hear from him uh, again. This young woman uh, lives in Bangladesh and um, her mother uh, leads a youth theater group. And one of the things that she started doing when she was 13, so she'd been involved in this uh, since she was a child. One of the things that she started doing when she was 13 was that her mother uh, basically was not open to including uh, uh, children who were living in the street who were quote unquote untouchables. And um, she was outraged by this. And so she talked her mother into allowing her to recruit street children to join the theater group. And I'll just read this quote from her. When I came across underprivileged children, I thought that they may have a lot of undiscovered talent. I've been able to mobilize about 40 children and incorporate them in my theater group. My friends and I are practicing theater with these children during our time between studies. We are informing them about their rights through this art form and educating them about responsible citizenship, character, and morals. If we can integrate them in our society through theater and give them a chance, each one of these children will be a shining star in the future. So, you know, this is the idealism. One of the qualities of youth is the idealism um, that can break boundaries. That even though her mother, I'm sure, was a very well-meaning person, she was nonetheless bound by some of the prejudices that are typical uh, of the caste structure in Bangladesh. Jerome Foster uh, started um, a, a publication called The Climate Reporter. This has a website. Uh, which is really an international web publication about climate change um, that he continues to co-edit um, with uh, other youth. I think he's in his early 20s now, but he started four or five years ago. Um, this young woman who uh, lived in Bellevue, Washington, so she was a high school junior when she got going, um, she invented something called HemaCam, which is a machine learning web app that can employ any smartphone to diagnose sickle cell disease with 95% accuracy when combined with a 3D printed microscope that attaches to the smartphone's camera. Uh, so she said in a lot of areas around the world, it's difficult to get basic screening or medical care. Even though a microscope is fairly common lab equipment, it's still quite expensive and a lot of clinics abroad don't have access to microscopes or enough trained professionals to read them. They do have a lot of access to smartphones and a lot of smartphones are being recycled nowadays. And I just thought we could really use this powerful device that all of us have in our pockets to solve another problem. So one of the other uh, patterns, um, and again, I, I you know, I've, I could um, sit here and, and um, identify 200 of these people if we had a couple of hours, but I'm not going to, obviously. But um, I can't claim statistically that this is happening. You know, I don't have enough data. There's like 8 billion people. Um, so this is an anecdotal assertion. But one of the anecdotal trends is that young women 
are being called to do technological, scientific and technological development. And again, this is something uh, because of access, um, access to the tools, access to the technology, access to other people on the internet. Uh, and the fact that in this generation, uh, there's less sexism than we've seen previously. So let me do a couple more here. Um, Joshua Williams started a program in Florida called Joshua's Heart that uh, distributes food. Um, he's distributed over 650,000 pounds of food through this project over nine years. And then when he saw that there were families that uh, were really not able to cook the food that his group was distributing, um, he set up cooking lessons and um, set up a mobile, a couple of mobile kitchens and had them driving around to the places where people congregated um, in the greater Miami area. So again, he started when he was 13 doing this. Um, Peyton Klein, which is an interesting story. Um, she was in a high school class um, and sitting behind her was an immigrant uh, young woman. And um, she really didn't perceive, um, she didn't really know how to make friends with this person. And she also realized that she had expectations or suppositions about uh, this person that were wrong because this was a young woman wearing a hijab and she had no previous experience with that. So when she was 15, she decided she was gonna learn more about this. And she created a program called the Global Minds Initiative where she raised money that um, created a youth by youth program where people who were native English speakers would be paired with immigrants who were in school with them so that they could get to know each other and um, you know, get beyond the initial boundaries. And maybe I'll do one more here. So here's another uh, technical. Um, this young man, when he was 14, uh, had an initial uh, food allergy, which turned out to be not so bad, but um, he had a lot of tests, which he didn't like very much. So he decided that there had to be a better way. He lives in Santa Clara. Um, so he spent several years uh, engaging in research and um, basically came up with a um, new type of DNA test that could be used to distinguish between a potentially deadly food allergy and a minor food allergy. So again, this is another element, I should have named this, um, which is uh, in our time, you know, if, if you want to buy a, DNA, a kit for DNA splicing, um, you can go online and buy one for $200. Now, this is both, um, you know, kind of astonishing and somewhat scary, but um, it's a reality of our time. Um, so let me stop there. I, I have many others, but let's see where we are here. Whoops, there's Emma. I'm sure you've all seen Emma. Let me stop there and stop my share. Um, Here we go, there. Okay, so I have some things in the chat. Good, let me take a look here. So, um, how do we create the vehicles to create communication? Um, I'm not sure, Jane, what you're asking. Do you wanna clarify that? Question? Well, basically, we need to have some way of, I have another question, which is how do we incentivize young people to engage in entrepreneurial efforts? How do we need to change the structure of our education to teach these skills and encourage this form of communication and creativity? We have to have a support system. Do we need to create more maker spaces to make the needed technology and research available? In other words, there's got to be some way, you know, the exceptional people will always be able to do these things. How do we reach everybody else? How do we give them meaningful activities at not, I mean, after basically middle school, 
is what you're talking about after seventh and eighth grade. Okay. Well, you know, one, one of the ironies of our current society is that our school paradigm is the most reactionary uh, element in our society. We're, we're a very strange people in that on one hand, um, we're willing to go out and embrace the latest technological development with a passion. And yet we are still invested in a school structure that was invented in Prussia in 1807. Literally, um, this is not hyperbole, this is literally. Uh, Horace Mann went to Prussia in the 1840s um, and copied the schools that they had in Prussia, brought them back to Massachusetts, convinced the legislature in Massachusetts for the first time to engage in universal taxation to educate the young, which had uh, pro previously been resisted by property owners and um, created the model of schooling you know, that we have, uh, age grading, keeping kids together the same age, single grades, keeping kids, giving kids a new teacher or new teachers every year, 12 years of schooling, the same subject you know, that we've had since the 1890s. Um, so this is, you know, we have many models that people have developed, even going back to John Dewey, uh, many, many people have written about and many people have started examples of schools at the secondary level that would be much more aligned with being responsive to the individual capacities and gifts and limitations of each person. You when know. I was in the, in the 70s, I worked at the Learning Research and Development Center. Mm -hmm. And what we were doing was working on individualized instruction, mm -hmm. starting uh, computer assisted instruction, researching uh, learning environments, um, and of course, Montessori schools were very much being developed. But the problem we had was getting the teachers to adopt the systems because they didn't have the materials. They didn't have the way of testing students and then giving them an individualized learning plan so that they could go on their own. Now, we have the systems in place, the technology in place to do that, but we still, as far as I can tell, aren't implementing it. Um, and we still haven't, I, I don't see this happening in our school system, even today, although we have all the technology. So how do we make it happen? Well, if I knew the answer to that question, I would have done it already, Jane. I mean, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. But our, our school paradigm is the most absolutely, you know, I, I spent 30 years of my life trying to change public schools. Uh, and I have failed many, many other people, you know, thousands of people have tried to do that. Again, beginning with John Dewey in 1905. And every, uh, you know, we have all failed to do that. So I don't take it personally anymore. Not just me. I don't know the answer to that. That's the question. And, you know, public schools are controlled by government. So we would need a governmental change um, to make this happen. So let me speak to this other, because it's, it's really a question I can't answer. Let me look, Ted has a question. Uh, what are the influence of parents? I mean, obviously parents, uh, you know, all these, all these young people have parents and obviously they've been supported by their parents uh, in some way or another, I would imagine, you know, I haven't investigated the parents, but clearly, um, Parents have a big role in this. And one of the qualities that the parents bring to this, I would imagine in 99% of these examples um, is support, is recognition that this is something that's worth doing. Um, in many cases, probably putting up some money to help them get the resources. Um, in other cases, they may also be, uh, you know, if you look at Greta, just to use her an example, you know, she skipped school every Friday for a year before anybody paid attention to her and her parents supported her. You know, I don't know that every parent would do that, but her parents, you know, she said, I'm not going to school. Of course, um, her parents also may have realized that they didn't really want to mess with Greta since, um, 
She's a very strong-willed young woman in the best possible way. But her parent, I, I've listened to her mother talk about it, and her, you know, her parents supported her. So I would imagine, Ted, that that's the case with all these young people. Let me see if there's other. Um, so there's a question from Terry. I feel there's an opportunity in the pandemic for quote a rewrite of school curriculum and more deeply embed service learning. And that's maybe sense, that's where you need to work. Provides a structure of making out yeah, and working in teams. Well, these are all elements, you know, Terry, that would move us in that direction. Um, and again, that's, you know, how, how do you get the system to change? I mean, one of the um, elements with, you know, one of the, the hopes of being the beginning for charter schools back in 1990, when charter schools were first envisaged, was the idea that they would be laboratories for innovation. But then what happened? The states said, well, okay, we'll give you money for charter schools, but we're gonna make your kids take the same tests and we're gonna hold you responsible to the same testing system as the other public schools. So the moment that you do that, you reduce the capacity for real innovation. So you need a different kind of assessment system. Um, I absolutely believe that all these examples of young people that I've cited and all the others um, could demonstrate capacity that would be valued in adult society. But would they all be able to pass trigonometry? Probably not. Would they all be able to, um, you know, pass uh, American history? Well, nobody in the society knows much about American history. So that's another problem. Um, you know, we'd have to recognize this notion that uh, there isn't a need for a common curriculum for all youth. And in fact, also that um, the idea that high school somehow prepares you for adulthood is just not true. Again, we don't know what adult society is going to be like in 10 years. I mean, you know, uh, let me think about in, in 2008, so that's 13 years ago, um, there was no social media. Think about it. I mean, you know, most of us live most of our lives without social media. On the other hand, for young people today and anybody under 20, social media is a central part of their lives. And I would bet for any of you who have grandchildren, social media is also a big part of your life right now. So we don't have a predictable notion of the future. And what I would argue, and I think this is fairly obvious once you get to know some of these young people, is that young people who are capable and invited to participate and contribute in adult society are much more likely to be able to have successful adult lives and be successful and contributing citizens and community members because they will have started to uh, learn how to do that in their youth. And the other thing about this is, you know, um, yeah, I, I, I inevitably have to struggle against, you know, being kind of a stereotypical old guy fuddy-duddy who is just dismissive of youth culture and I try hard to be respectful of youth culture today, even though I don't particularly appreciate it. But I remember back to my own youth culture, which I certainly appreciated. But youth culture is not a good thing in and of itself because it separates youth from adults. And when we, when we stick kids in high school for four years, what we're doing, you know, as essentially I say, we're putting them in the, in the teen ghetto and what we're saying to them is that what you do in life is really not important. It's really not important. You know, you have to wait. When you get older, then you could do something that's important. But right now, you just need to go to high school and, you know, shut up and do what you're told. And, you know, we all went to high school. You can, you know, what do you do? You go somewhere and you sit and then you go somewhere else and you sit and then you go somewhere else and you sit. And then you go to lunch 
I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not all that much. Um, high school is, is not a, you know, a, a social structure that has a lot to do with normal human desires or behavior. Let me see if there's another, any other questions here. No, anybody else have questions they'd like comments they'd like to share? Max, you can unmute at this point if you want. Can't hear you. Um, so, so, so David, where is your book available? Um, I'll get to that in a sec. Well, if, if, if people would like to know here, wait a second. It's available on Amazon, but I'm, I'm not here selling books here. Let me get right to this. Um, uh -oh. I'm ready. <laughs> okay, just a second, and I'll come back to you. Um, if you'd like a PDF, I'd be happy to send it to you, uh, no charge. So if you just send me a little note saying you'd like uh, a PDF of this guidebook, um, I'll send it along. Okay. okay. Do, you, do you have a website? Do you have a website, David? The, well, the website for this is Evolu uh what is it called? <laughs> uh, I should know what my own website is called here. Yeah. Let's see, what is it? It's called uh, visionaryyouth.org. So I have a, I have a question. What yeah, go you? ahead, please. Uh, well, what, what you're proposing or what we're hearing and, and going along with and loving uh, is a, uh, uh, a, a, a an environment that encourages youth to uh, use their their native abilities, uh, uh, natural abilities, propensity, and and what I'm suggesting is, wouldn't this be a uh, a valid approach, or wouldn't this desirable approach? Uh, could it be used or encouraged to be used on all age groups uh, throughout a kind of a cultural event? Uh, just kind of a, instead of us all taking LSD, have some kind of a governmental, uh, uh, you know, uh, something dictate that would that would encourage this this wonderful. Uh, uh, freedom to f fear of failure, I would call it, uh, kind of, you know, reduce that, that fear of that if we fail, we're not successful. You know, the, the idea of keep failing, uh, fail again, fail harder, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I'm just going to throw that out to you. Well, all of these young people have failed. That, so that's one of the key characteristics of all of them is that they all there, is that none of them are doing these things in school and all of them are continuing to work at whatever their project is. Mm -hmm. That's exactly, which is what adults do. You know, we, we, uh, um, we, we continue if we're guided or, or, in, you know, in, embodied to, or um, idealize whatever the word I'm looking for is not coming. Uh, if we're profoundly motivated to get something done, we continue to work at it. And all of these youths, um, and again, I mean, Greta obviously is an extreme example, but you know, she sat there by herself for a year. I mean, she didn't know anything was gonna happen. I mean, it's extraordinary, but she didn't know it was gonna happen. She was determined. Uh, the, the folks who've engaged in technological and scientific development that I cited, I have about 25 more. You know, these are all activities where they worked on it for years. Um, so let me say a couple more things before you all go. I want to tie this together. So, cause there's something particularly important about this, um, that I haven't spoken to yet. So again, 310,000 years or 160,000 years. And here we are really in the last 60 years. This is like an infinitesimal part of our span as a species. We have this incredible potential um, to evolve 
as a species. We have this incredible potential because we're wealthy enough that we can say to these young people, um, you know, find your dream and follow it right now and see where it leads you. And one of the, one of the things that uh, I go back to, one of the insights that I go back to, um, you know, as Margaret Mead talked about in her last book, uh, which came out, I think it's 1975. I could probably remember the title of it, but I'd have to work at it a little bit, but I remember the, the content. She said um, that for the most part of human history, uh, cultures have been such that the old people knew more about how to do things and how things work than the young. And, you know, again, if we go back, I don't even go back 160,000 years. If you go back 12,000 years to the beginning of agriculture and, um, you know, culture and the way that we understand it, um, you know, for almost all of that time, maybe until 1800, uh, the old did know more than the young. But what happened beginning around 1800 is that things began to change more quickly. And one of the, one of the qualities that you see in um, diaries um, and people living in the 19th century was they, they began to complain about acceler acceleration of change. Of course, from our point of view, it seemed fairly slow. You know, if you recall, remember in the school, we learned about this, we learned about electricity and the steamboat and the railroad and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, but if we go and look between 1800 and now, it's clear that there's been an acceleration of change in social life, um, you know, and basically throughout the world, uh, no one is really immune. And, um, you know, we're, we're working very hard to make sure that everybody on, on the planet is no longer isolated. And you could argue that's a bad thing. That's a whole other question, but so, but we have this gift. Margaret Mead said, well, there's a difference in what happened. She was talking in 19, about the 1960s. And initially she said, well, what's happened now in the 1960s is that the young see the world, they see the present, they see the reality in a way that has validity in a way that they're, uh, the old don't see but that the old still have wisdom that comes from living. And the generation gap is a break between these two generations that at the time was relatively unbridgeable. There were, there were very few elders who were available to us in the 1960s who understood the social movements and co conscious movements of the 1960s. Most of the old folks um, did not get it. Of course, we didn't respect them. So there was, you know, mutual disrespect. And what she said is that what we need to move to um, is a place that's a lot more like where we are now and we could be even more, which is that there is a way in which the young see the reality more clearly than the old do because they don't bring 50, 60, 70 years of experience and memory and um, to it. You know, we, we see reality through the lens of our experience inevitably. So the young have a clarity about them. On the other hand, the old have wisdom from living. You know, if you're paying attention, you do get wise in, in living. And what she said is that when the old can respect the vitality and the imagination of the young and invite them to manifest that vitality and imagination and idealism, even though it may be excessive, it may be out of control at times, it may be immature at times and all those things, then the young folks will be interested in what the old folks have to say. But the old folks have to be respectful to begin with, because if we're not respectful, this is what elders do. And one of the good things about our time now is that a lot of us, you know, I know some of you, 
Um, I know that you're elders, and I bet that most of you or all of you here are elders. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be here. But there's a particularly critical role for elders right now. Uh, and given the advancing lifespan that's been given to us, you know, we have an opportunity to, to enact this role, and I would argue an obligation. And when we do it, the young people will be more uh, supported, and we can have this potential of, I'm not saying we'll have utopia in 20 years, but I think there's a potential for an enormous reorganization um, of the way in which people on the planet interact with each other. Um, and the last thing I'll say about that is that we, you know, we have created, um, in some sense, the perfect uh, evolutionary crisis, um, which is climate change, which is a universal, unescapable, inescapable challenge to everybody on the planet, except maybe the ultra rich who can go up in their yachts and pretend that they're immune. But everybody else, you know, we're all at risk. And it seems to me that this is another opportunity. I'm not saying it, I would choose to have climate change if it were up to me, but it's not up to me and it's here and it's happening. And the reality is that we have an opportunity um, to really come together as a species um, and create some profoundly new kinds of relationships. And I believe that our young people are doing that right now. You know, they're doing it because they're online in ways that we can't even imagine in terms of interacting with people in different societies, people of different races, different ethnicity, different religions, uh, and all those things. So this is my, my five minute preaching. I'll stop. That's enough. Uh, that's, that's enough for me about that. So, so let's see if there's other, how do we bridge the gap? Well, I, I, you know, that's a good question. I, I would, I would say whenever individually we can encourage uh, youths, you know, people in their teens to identify a passion and follow it, you know, that's how we can bridge the gap. You know, people, you are your own grandchildren, or I don't know, people, if those of us who are still, you know, many of us, I'm sure before COVID we're volunteering, I'm sure we'll be volunteering again. Um, you know, with people we know, that's the place to begin. Because I don't know how we change the schools. You know, if I knew that, um, I would tell you. I would tell a lot of people. I've, I've written a lot about that, and none of, and many, many, many other people have as well. Without changing the school, the schools seem to return. You, you know, you get pushed out, and they return, and you get pushed out, and they return, and they pushed out, and they return. And um, we don't seem to have a capacity. You know, we've had 20 years now of No Child Left Behind uh, as federal law. And No Child Left Behind has accomplished almost nothing. I mean, literally, even by its own standards, test scores, it's accomplished nothing. Test scores are not higher now than they were 20 years ago. And yet we don't have a capacity, you know, to do anything about it. Jenny. Um, yeah, I can't write it in the chat, um, but it's as we're talking about it, and as I look around at this group of people and the people who are ready to, to do this, we're mostly educated people and we've had money. And that's the concern that I have. From what you're talking about, it feels to me as if one yeah. way to go is to understand that those of us who can do it need to become mentors in some kind of a way to everybody, including parents and everybody else who don't mm -hmm. know how to do this, who don't know, who don't have, I mean, I, I realize I came from a family in which my mother was a go-getter and my youngest, my second sister at 14, when you were talking about that, I'm thinking, oh my God, yes, in my family, there's somebody who started a whole group, youth group for, mm -hmm. for a nuclear disarmament and mm -hmm. arranged stuff. And from the, the day to, that she died, or to the day she died, she was still doing that. But boy, she had family history behind her and not everybody can have that because they, they themselves didn't have the education. So tell me how to find, figure out how to mentor everybody. 
Well, I don't know about everybody, but you could mentor one person. Yeah. As a start. It starts. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, I would let 16 year olds vote. I would, I would let 14 year olds vote. I mean, why this arbitrary distinction? Um, if we want youth to, you know, to begin taking up the responsibilities in adult life, um, you know, why can't they vote? 14 year olds, I mean, 14 year olds who are paying attention have the capacity to make discrimination and distinctions in political life, um, as well as, you know, 30 year olds who are not paying attention or 60 year olds or, um, you know, there's no reason, you know, but, you know, realistically probably going to 16 is the next step. And I would love to see that happen. I think that would be enormously productive. Nancy. Yes. One of the things that I can say uh, that is important to me at age 80 is to continue learning. Because mm -hmm. if you stop learning and finding out what is going on or listening to people like you or all the other things we do, there's no way you can begin to solve any problems. But if you stay current, if you look into the different issues, if you, I don't mean to be crazy about it, but just stay current with what's going on, I think you're much better shaped to do any kind of mentoring. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think that's absolutely true. And, and at the same time, you know, just to say, I, I'll speak for myself. Um, you know, I have to remind myself um, that my particular experience, you know, is unique to me, although there obviously is a generational quality. And that when I listen to 14 year olds or 16 year olds, I'm not necessarily the best judge. You know, my, my immediate response to say, well, that doesn't make any sense. I, I try not to say things like that because they're, you know, I, I, you know, this is a cliche, but I think it's true for me, for me, but you know, the older I get, the less I know. I, and I think that's, you know, about what's really happening for people who are prof at a profoundly different age than I am and who have a profoundly different life experience. I guess I want to go back to the issue of how we can bridge the gap. We can try to reach out to the neighborhood kids and engage them in con conversation or engage them in projects that enable conversation. They may or may not be interested. Um, is there a way to engage them online? Should we be setting up a mentoring uh, forum of some sort online that people can engage in? Um, I mean, we have an Ollie program. We have, uh, can we set up a, a, there is a, they set up in Fortuna and I don't know what happened to it, the intergenerational um, uh, group. Uh, there was an actual um, organization and I have no idea what happened to it or how successful it was, but the concept is something that would be really good to do if we could figure out how to do it. Um, even through things like the senior center, we could have them invite young people to join seniors when we can get together again, but there are online, I mean, vehicles that could be used in between. Um, we could try to intersect with the educational online programming to see if there are ways to uh, connect there. Um, I think there are things we could do if we created a group with the purpose of trying to make that happen? Um, well, Jane, here's what I would, very concrete suggestion for you. Um, find a 16 year old who's interested and work with that person. Yeah, I know one. Okay, and no, seriously, I'm, I'm not, I mean, find, find a couple of, of folks who are youths who, are, who would be interested in engaging with folks like us and have them organize it. Let them organize. Turn let it them around the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Let the, you know. Invite them to design it. Invite them to organize it. Invite them to lead. They they have the capacity. Um, I mean, when, when I was sixteen, you know, my my high school hosted a Model United Nations conference, which was great. I was a junior in high school. Uh, I was the assistant secretary general. That was quite quite a role, and. Um, we had an office, we had a refrigerator, um, we had a telephone, 
uh, I had a permanent pass, talk about luxury. Uh, but the main thing was, you know, we organized a conference where we brought 600 people to our community for a weekend. And we organized their transportation, we organized their housing, we organized their food, we organized their recreation. Um, and of course we had a model United Nations conference. You know, I mean, I probably learned more about leadership and organizational development from working on that for a year um, than I did anything else, you know, before I was 25. That was like a real, you know, organizational development project. So it happened to take place in the context of a high school, but it was a real thing. You know, if we, if we, didn't, if we didn't get it organized right, um, there would have been a lot of unhappy people and we would have had a lot of people mad at us. You know, there, people wouldn't have gotten to the ho houses they were supposed to be, the bus routes would have been screwed up. We would have had a terrible band at the dance. The food would have been terrible. You know, we had to work with the kitchen staff to get uh, food that transcended our normal lunch food. I mean, it was a complex organization. So tell you, that was probably the best learning experience I had in, in public education in 12 years. When I was in Nashville, I spent eight years running Nashville's Business Expo mm -hmm. and Career Conventions for Women. And what you in essence did was get industry to have the expo that funded the conference and you brought in people from all over. And it, it was very successful and, and you could do that same concept in a community working with young people. Mm -hmm. okay. But but you don't do it with them, they do it. That's my point. Yeah, the point is they do it, but you, you brought in volunteers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you had the organization to get it started and, and but mm -hmm. you taught, I mean you engaged the volunteers to make it happen. I you know, in the in the model UN experience I had, you know, the 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 my the secretary general who was the boss and I, of course I did get the job through nepotism, what can I say? Um, but, you know, we, we had teacher, uh, advisors who basically said to us, you know, you do the work, don't screw it up, which was not the only way that this thing happened, of course, but we had the, the great benefit of having, you know, they paid attention they, they made sure that things were going on. Um, but they trusted us, you know, to do it. And we did, and we, you know, we had to say something. Sure. I don't know who that Could is. I go say ahead. something? Sure, Ted, go ahead. That's me. <laughs> uh, I had a different life. Uh, I had a lot of love in our family and uh, a love for our kids. We had three kids. I was a university professor. This, all three kids became university professors. And I believe that it had a lot to do with this topic for this Friday, love. We had a family house full of love. Uh, my wife has passed away now, but she was a wonderful, loving mother. David, it looks like I'm Karen, Karen you, also has a question. Okay. More than a question, I have a comment. Mm -hmm. um, we've been talking about how we as individuals can uh, develop and show respect to individuals, which is one way of approaching a, a change in our society. Mm -hmm. I think the, the quickest way for us to make a change in our society would be for our schools to put much more attention to teaching the ability to think in very critical ways mm -hmm. rather than just uh, being forced to memorize so many uh, dates or ideas or things from what we know of history because it is history which we need but you have to have critical thinking to be observant and then deal with what you observe. Mm -hmm. We can't do that on a one by one by one through all of our people. We need to do that in our schools. 
I don't know how you do it. Well, but... I, I don't entirely agree. I think people learn how to think by being engaged in life. Well, and to a, to exactly. a large, you know, they're not alone. They're not, there's, I mean, they're interacting with other people. But, but they, the schools need the projects like you were doing all the way through their learning and curriculum. Well, um, again, this goes back to the, the reactionary character of, of school paradigm, which is that, uh, again, I mean, John Dewey proposed this in 1905. There was a big effort in the 60s to get critical thinking. There was another effort in the 80s to get critical thinking. Um, you know, I, and again, just to be clear, I, I don't blame the teachers. This is not the teacher's fault. The teachers basically are doing what they're told. Mm -hmm. And and many, many teachers, many, many of the best teachers quit after, after No Child Left Behind uh, was passed. I'm sure that happened here as well. So it, it's a it's a you know it's a problem that goes to the fundamental uh, character of our schooling and um, you know this goes back to the, the the consciousness of our political leaders and our political leaders are basically I mean they're not alone I mean the, the, there's only one nation state really on the planet that's really evolving the school paradigm and that's Finland. And, you know, Finland is, they're really working on evolving the school paradigm out of this Prussian model, but everybody else is still doing the, you know, the Canadians, the Germans, the British, um, the French, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's something incredibly, um, again, I don't, I don't know what it is, uh, but reactionary <laughs> about the school paradigm. And in many ways, maybe, maybe, you know, part of the, um, this, the unconscious uh, is that we want to contain youth because on some level we're afraid of them. You know, we, we, you know, if we keep them in school, they're contained. You know, they can't do, they can't take over for, they displace us or something. I don't know, I'm just, you know, fantasizing a little bit now. So I don't know if that's the reality or not, but they're, you know, I do, I do know that we're not the only ones who are stuck. And, you know, this notion of teaching critical thinking in school, I mean, Clearly, that's a good idea, and clearly, we don't do it. You know, and um, you know, every time, and I mean, I'm very knowledgeable about the history of high school. I wrote, I wrote an encyclopedia entry about the history of high school maybe 20 years ago, right before No Child, and um, every time that there's been a progressive movement, uh, which there have been, to to reform high school. There's been a reactionary pushback to return to, um, you know, teach it and test it. So there's one other question here. Um, I want to or comment um, from Richard. I don't know if Richard is still with us. Um, what was the last time you saw youth and elders being portrayed as interacting in a meaningful way in the media? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. But I think that what this also begs the question, a, a different question, which is, um, what is the media anymore? And, um, you know, the media is so complex now and multifarious and different generations have different media. Um, so, you know, there's no, there, there is no, I mean, again, um, <clears throat> when, when we were youths, there was ABC and NBC and CBS. There wasn't even PBS yet. That came like 68 or something. So, and then there was radio and then um, that was it. So now, you know, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of media and who knows what the media even is anymore. So this is also one of the elements where I remind myself that I, I really have no idea ultimately what's going on, particularly for young people. I'm sorry to say that, but, but I absolutely do believe I've been tracking this phenomenon of youth uh, doing incredible things for two and a half years now. And the more that I look, the more that I find. But as I said before, um, I can only present you with anecdotal evidence. I, I don't have statistical evidence. And I'm not particularly motivated to find it myself. So hopefully somebody else will find it. <laughs> I, 
Are there I any think... other questions? David, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the discussion. I appreciate the openness. And I think it would be interesting to follow this up in the future to see how, if any of us have come up with ways of interacting with the younger generation and becoming mentors in our own way.